Hi guys, Olive here, here today to share with you what I am planning on reading in the final month of 2020. When I was structuring December's TBR, I had two main goals in mind. The first goal was to tie up loose ends, basically, to maybe finish some stragglers from previous month's TBRs, to close out some projects that I was working on this year. Basically, I want to end the year on a good note. And the other goal that I have for December is to read a ton of five-star fiction books. Now, I know that's always loosely the goal for anybody's TBR, to read a bunch of five-star books, but the same thing that happened to me last year is happening again to me this year, where we're approaching the end of the year and I'm realizing that where I have a ton of five-star nonfiction books to choose from when I go to make my top nonfiction books of 2020 list, I am lacking options when it comes to fiction. There are so many fiction books that I picked up this year that I thought I was going to love, that I thought would be contenders for that year-end favorites list, and they just were not it. I really hope I don't end up jinxing myself by doing this, but I am putting a number of fiction books on December's TBR that I think have a real possibility of being five-star reads. Some of them are books I've deliberately put off because I think I'm going to love them and I wanted to save them for a time where I just needed a slam dunk and we're there. But before I talk about those five-star fiction predictions, essentially, I do want to talk about the classic I'm planning on reading in the month of December. This was one of the books off of my classics I want to read in 2020 list, so I probably should make an attempt to read it. It is Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. This is the story of an orphaned boy who has a really hard time in life starting from the moment that he's born. Throughout the book, different colorful characters come into his worlds and basically take turns at being corrupting influences. I'll be honest and say that I've had a really hard time getting into Charles Dickens. I've read arguably his two most famous books, A Tale of Two Cities and Great Expectations. And while I love the plots of his books, I think they're fascinating. I hate his execution. I think it is so plodding and so boring. I can't get great expectations out of my head plot-wise, but when I tried to reread it after first picking it up in high school, it was such a slog. But I'm not ready to give up. I want to see if there's a Dickens book out there for me, especially because Katie from Books and Things, who I think is just incredible. She loves Charles Dickens. I do know, however, that this is her least favorite Dickens. I will make sure to keep that in mind as I go through this book, but I'm determined to find the Dickens book that works for me. But now on to the handful of fiction titles that I feel pretty confident could round out my year-end fiction favorites list. I am crossing my fingers so hard that any or all of these are spectacular. I'm not quite sure my heart could take it if all of these end up being letdowns. No pressure. So first up is a book that I have literally been putting off because I have a gut feeling it's going to be a new favorites. I'm very into delayed gratification, if you couldn't tell. It's Actress by Anne Enright. This is a novel following the daughter of a famous Irish stage actress as she delves into the secrets of her mother's past and her own in the process. I think I'm going to love this one because I've heard a ton of good things about it. It was long listed for the Women's Prize this year. But also there's just something about it that feels reminiscent of my favorite book, Rules of Civility. That is the main reason why I think I'm going to love this one. Maybe I'll be way off base, but I hope I'm not. Another one I think I'm going to love because it reminds me of a favorite is The Ensemble by Aja Gable. This is a book about a group of four friends who make up a string quartet. These four people, however, probably would not have become friends if it weren't for their shared love of music, so they have really complex relationships with one another. I definitely suspect that this book is going to share some similarities with The Interestings by Meg Wallitzer, which is one of my all-time favorite fiction books. I'm hoping then that I fall under this book's spell in the same way that I did when I was reading The Interestings. This next book isn't one that reminds me of any of my favorites. It's just one I think is going to be directly up my alley. It's Disappearing Earth by Julia Phillips. You might have heard about this one already. This one has been extremely popular over the past year. It's a slow-moving mystery surrounding the kidnapping of two sisters, and it is set on a remote Siberian peninsula. 
First of all, I think it's an ideal time for me to pick up this book as we in the Northern Hemisphere head into winter. It is definitely getting mighty cold here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So I think that will put me in the right headspace to pick up this book. Plus, it seems like there's going to be potentially some nature writing in this book. It seems to be one of the quietly powerful novels that I end up loving so much. And this book is set in Russia. All signs point to me loving this. The next book I put on my December TBR is a little bit riskier of a selection. Chances are I'm going to love it or absolutely hate it because I'm quite picky about historical fiction set in Russia and that's what the next book is. It's Tsarina by Ellen Olbston. This book follows a famous Catherine from Russia, but not the Catherine that you would immediately think of. Catherine the Great was actually Catherine the Second. Catherine the First was the second wife of Peter the Great, who rose from being a peasant to briefly reigning over Russia herself. I have found with historical fiction set in Russia, I'm fine with a little bit of drama added to the real life historical events to make it a little bit more exciting. That's fine, but I think it needs to be firmly rooted in the actual history. I'm a Russian history buff. That's always how I'm going to feel. And briefly looking into this author's background, I don't see anything to suggest that she knows much of anything about Russia beyond the research that she did for this book, which makes me nervous. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it's fantastic because I am so on board with lesser known women in Russia getting the limelight. Now it's just Elizabeth, Peter the Great's daughter, who needs her own novel, a good one preferably. A book I have significantly more confidence in is Moonflower Murders by Anthony Horowitz. This is the sequel to Magpie Murders, which I absolutely loved earlier this year. In this follow-up to Magpie Murders, the publisher who was at the center of the first book, Susan Ryland, is once again the main character. She's in Greece when she meets a mysterious family and this family tells her a story of how a murder took place in the same hotel and on the same day that their daughter was married. And more than that, the writer that was at the center of the first book who Susan Ryland was working with before he died knew the murder victim. I consider it extremely good luck that I held off reading Magpie Murders as long as I did. I read it just earlier this year, so I didn't have to wait a full three years in between books. I'm not at all convinced I could have waited that long. I am so excited to read this. Then to close out my unofficial project of reading at least one romance book per month, except Nonfiction November, of course, I'm going to be picking up Alyssa Cole's new book that actually comes out today. How to Catch a Queen. This book marks the start of a new series for her, although it does seem at least loosely connected to the previous series, the Runaway Royal series, because we briefly met the two main characters in this new book in the last book of that previous series. One of the two main characters of this book, Shanti, grew up with the singular focus of someday becoming a queen and making a difference. But when she finally gets her wish and she marries the new young king of a small African country, she's disappointed to find that she's kept on a shelf. She's not able to help the people and her new husband basically ignores her because everyone in the castle thinks that she's only there on a trial basis. But obviously that begins to change. I really like Alyssa Cole. I think her writing is so sexy and so effortlessly cool. I have read quite a few books in my day, including some romance books, where you can tell when the author is trying their hardest to seem cool or to come across as funny. And that's never the case with Alyssa Cole. She is actually funny and actually cool. I give her a ton of credit because I think her books are a main reason why I've gotten into romance the way that I have. So I'm really looking forward to this new series. Series. But you know I can't go a whole month reading exclusively fiction. This is me we're talking about after all. There's got to be at least a few nonfiction titles sprinkled in there as well. So Disappearing Earth will not be the only seasonal read that I'll be attempting to pick up this month because I also have my eye on Silences So Deep by John Luther Adams. This is a memoir of the author's life spent composing music in the Alaskan wilderness and it seemed like a great one to pick up in the same month that I picked up not only Disappearing Earth, 
Earth, but also the ensemble because of the musical element. But it's going to be a big month for music books, apparently, because I would also like to pick up Singular Sensation by Michael Rydell, which is all about Broadway in the 1990s and what a big decade it was. It also seems like there's going to be a discussion about 9-11 in this book and how Broadway helped bring New Yorkers together in the aftermath of the attacks. I think this is going to be a great one. It will certainly inspire me to listen to some Broadway soundtracks on repeat throughout December. And then the final book on my December TBR is The Book Collectors by Delphine Minwi. This is a book about a group of individuals in the town where the Syrian civil war began. They would collect books from the rubble and then they made an underground library that was composed of the thousands of volumes that they collected. From the moment I heard about this book, I knew I needed to get my hands on it. It seems like it's going to be equal parts devastating and inspirational. So those are the books that I intend to read in the final month of 2020. If the universe is feeling generous, perhaps one or two of the fiction books I selected will end up on my year-end fiction favorites list, maybe? I would love to hear from you if you have read any of these books, if you've heard of any of them, or if you would now like to read them after seeing them in this video. That or any other more general comments or questions you may have can go in the comment section below. But if you would prefer to reach out to me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.